everybody, welcome to Q&A video number 64. Make sure you keep asking questions, doesn't matter they're about, they can be about anything. Just know I don't respond to review requests or let's play requests in these videos, but I will respond to them in the comments. Once again, a review request is basically what do you think about insert game here. That goes on the review request list and that's pretty much it. Also, people, please make sure you check the master list of all of my review requests, all the reviews that are done, all the MTOs that are done. All of it collected into one list that is readily accessible on my channel page. Because yeah, people keep asking me about things way. that I have already said that I'm going to do. Anyway, the gameplay in the background is of the Rainbow Six Siege open beta. It actually opened up yesterday for us closed beta players. And now it's available for everyone. So... If you've got Uplay, then you might as well give it a try. It's worth checking out at least. Although, keep in mind it is still a beta and they still haven't really fixed the matchmaking. So, it is kinda messy. Anyway, it ties in with this first question that we have from Matoro Zelif. When you're playing competitive multiplayer games, do you choose a female or male character? In your opinion, does it make a difference in gameplay or a certain reaction amongst other players? Well. The reason it ties in with Rainbow Six Siege is because they do have a few female characters in there, but the way they've handled it is basically it's just the way that character looks and sounds. The actual mechanical difference is that everybody has their own specific abilities. For example, IQ, who I tend to play a lot, has an RED scanner which allows her to see the uh, readings of electronic devices that are scattered throughout the map, so things like booby traps and the actual objective uh, markers and such like that. And that's actually my primary concern with regards to playing a male or female character. It's not so much that they're male or female, it's what is their ability. I just like IQ's ability because in a lot of cases I just like being a support role, and so what ends up happening is that I pick that support role that works fairly well. Now if it's just a matter of looks or sounds, then I just pick whatever works best for me. And sometimes that means female characters, sometimes that means male characters. But there's also this conception of female characters being smaller and thus having smaller hitboxes than uh, male characters. Now, that's only true in some cases, not all of them, but in the cases where it is true, I don't really care as much, so I don't really pick the female character to have an advantage over the, the other characters. Instead, I'm just picking whatever I feel looks best for my particular situation, and sometimes that means female, sometimes that means male. Now, if you want to get more into other things, like RPGs, for example, more often than not in an RPG, I actually play a female character, just because I like to. It's not to say that I don't like playing male characters, it's just that more often than not in a tabletop RPG kind of setting, that I just like to play female characters. So yeah, mechanical considerations as far as abilities come first, and then after that it's pure aesthetics, and that's it. Next one is from Evil Shark 22 Hey DW, as a high school student I can tell you that vaporizing is on a major rise and is seeming to turn into, to a lesser extent, my generation's cigarettes. My question is, what are your thoughts on vaping and why do you think people under the age of 20 are using vapes for nicotine yet would never smoke a cigarette? Probably because you guys have been brought up to uh, think of cigarettes as this horrible evil thing that will give you lung cancer and while that is true, vaping is just kind of a new thing. Now, I don't do either of them. I'm actually extremely allergic to cigarettes, and I absolutely despise it when people smoke around me. And I have seen way too many people die of uh, lung-related problems, whether it be things like uh, COPD or lung cancer or whatever like that. So I am vehemently against putting anything in your lungs that is not supposed to be there. And that includes both uh, cigarette smoke and, of course, vaping vapors. And honestly, I've just been completely baffled my entire life as to why people smoke. I mean, I understand nicotine addiction, but I don't understand the appeal of starting to smoke. I mean, hell, I know people who are in the medical field and they smoke like crazy. And you would think of all people, medical people would be the ones who would avoid it like the plague. But nope, they flock right to it and it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I would think if you wanted to relax more, then you would be, I don't know, drinking instead of inhaling a stimulant like nicotine. Anyway, back to the topic at hand. At least vaping doesn't seem to be quite as horrible for you as cigarettes are. 
but I ultimately really don't understand why people think it's a good idea. It, you're putting something in your lungs that is not supposed to be in your lungs. That can't be good for you. But then again, if you are vaping or smoking, I guess you don't really care about what's good for you or not. Anyway, let's move on to a question from Dark X Assassin. To go back to your topic of stress at work, which is something I mentioned in a previous video, what do you think of elementary to high school in America? Is it good, bad, horrible? Also the big topic of homework and studies about how it is helpful or not helpful. Well, here's the problem with going over elementary and high school in America. It varies wildly depending on where you are. Some districts are extremely good, some districts are extremely bad, and there's everything in between. Now, when I was in elementary and high school, we didn't really have a huge amount of homework. We did have some, but most of the heavy stuff was coming from things like mathematics. And that's one instance where it's pretty much necessary because you learn math by doing it, really. You don't really learn it just by looking at things on a chalkboard or uh, hearing the teacher babble on about it or reading the book about it. You really do have to do it in order to actually understand what you're doing. And so in that sort of context, the homework is extremely helpful unless you get overloaded with it, which did happen on occasion. I would be given somewhere between 40 and 50 problems, but that was pretty rare, luckily. Usually it was somewhere around 20 to 30. And it would take forever to do, but all the homework for my other subjects wouldn't really take very long at all. So it was a really weird balancing issue, and these days it seems like there's way too much homework where the student gets home and they're doing homework for the next four hours or so, which is completely and utterly ridiculous, frankly. And you have to understand why it's like that. The problem isn't so much that some schools are better than others. The problem is that all they are concerned with are test scores, specifically standardized test scores, things like when you get into high school, moving towards your SAT and ACT. And instead of actually learning the subjects that you're supposed to be learning, instead of really learning how to uh, look for things in literature, how to think critically, you're learning a bunch of stuff that is for these specific tests, and that doesn't help you out at all. Instead, it just reinforces the idea of regurgitation. The teacher gives you a bunch of data, you regurgitate it to them. Congratulations, you've got an A. Woo. And then these students get out into the real world and they learn that, oh, wow, nobody gives a crap that I'm able to regurgitate things. They actually want to see me being able to think critically and such. Well, that sucks. I didn't learn how to do that in school. I guess I'm lucky in that I was brought up to not just regurgitate things, but to really think for myself. And that might actually explain why people are so incredibly defensive about overhyped video games. Hmm. Just a thought that I had. Oh, well. I'll consider that idea later. But anyway, the long and short of it is that until you get to the college level, you're not really thinking for yourself. You're just regurgitating at this point. And you're only doing it so you can gain a high test score, which will ultimately not really matter much at all in your life. And that's really not a healthy attitude for our schools to have. It's why our schools are not doing so well and why our students are ridiculously overstressed right now. And instead of learning valuable life skills like critical thinking, it's really just writing us into a corner. And I really hope we can dig ourselves out of that, because as it stands, it's kind of a mess, and I actually kind of fear for our future. And now let's move on to a question from Alexander P. And no, I don't speak Russian or any other Slavic language, nor can I read Cyrillic. I asked him to pronounce it for me. He wanted to ask, what do I think of monarchy? It depends entirely on who your monarch is and what kind of monarchy it is. If it's an absolute monarchy, I am very much inclined to dislike it. Because as we all know, positions of absolute power are inevitably corrupting influences. And let's face it, we've all seen what absolute monarchs have turned into, or absolute rulers in general, just dictators, monarchs, whatever it may well be. Throughout history, we've had these cautionary tales of these absolute monarchs who have just had unchecked power and basically driven their countries into the ground, among other things. And thus, an absolute monarchy is pretty much a terrible idea. Where it gets more wishy-washy is when you have constitutional monarchies like Great Britain, or I believe Sweden is one, Norway I believe is one as well. Uh, things like that, where they have a position of a monarch, but really it's more of a sort of representative democracy when it comes down to it, and the monarch is more of a figurehead than anything else. 
That sort of thing I'm generally okay with, although it can get kind of messy depending on how it's actually situated. For example, uh, the way the British government is currently set up is a complete disaster, frankly. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about there, you might want to give CGP Grey's video on the fairly recent British elections a watch because it's both amusing and really depressing. So that's something to keep in mind. As long as the monarchy is set up in a way where the people actually do have a strong say in their own governance and the monarch does not have absolute power, it's probably okay. Now there is something to be said for a strong central authority figure, and there have been kings and queens that have really been great for their countries, don't get me wrong, but more often than not, monarchy is just something that hasn't really worked all that well. It's more of a thing that we've done because that's just what we've done, and then when we finally got representative governments in, it became a mess, but at least the people have more of a say than if they did if they were in a monarchy or something like that. But therein lies the problem. It ultimately all comes down to the people. Are the people doing well? Are they benefiting from the way the government is set up? Are they benefiting from the monarchy? Or is the leader a tyrant? That'll go a long way in determining whether or not your monarchy is successful. I'm vehemently opposed to any sort of authoritarian regime that has any sort of absolute power. So monarchies have to work pretty hard in order to be able to be in my good graces. Let's put it that way. Last question for this Q&A is from Classic Comedy Fan. Hey DW, what do you consider the best alien designs, such as how thought out they would be, such as how an alien would develop and look, since many of them are uh, reptiles and mammals, which to him seems to not be very well thought out. Aliens can be whatever you want them to be. Now, as far as the effective designs go, H.R. Geiger's stuff has been pretty fantastic, but let's face it, Alien is a classic, and Aliens is a classic action movie now. But the further you go into sci-fi, the weirder things get, and you can find eventually things like the weird sludge in Prometheus, which was a absolutely horrible movie by the way, but anyway, there's things like that, there's things like these weird geometric shape kind of aliens, all sorts of things like that, all of which are really designed more to be odd and not something of this earth. That's the real point. If you look at something and you're like, okay, I could believe this came from another planet given this other planet's living conditions. Is it a breathable atmosphere? Well, not really. Then I wouldn't really expect much to have lungs, for example. Or if they did have some sort of lung structure, I would expect it to not be able to breathe Earth atmosphere. Or if it was a really rocky environment, I would expect it to have evolved with traits to uh, suit its rocky environment. Or if it were a, an environment with an extremely high amount of gravity, I would expect them to basically have ridiculously dense bone structure and things like that. The thing about sci-fi writers is that not very many of them are biologists, and so they don't really understand what goes into creating an organism in a certain way. And so they just write whatever comes to mind, and for most people, what immediately comes to mind is some sort of humanoid, where it has a lot of human traits, but it's not necessarily human. And thus you end up with things like Star Trek, where pretty much all the aliens look mostly human in a lot of regards. And that sort of stuff is fairly lazy, let's be fair here. But it's also not easy to design an alien that would actually look believable. So that is something to keep in mind. I thought Mass Effect did a pretty good job with it. But there aren't all that many sci-fi universes that have really, really well-designed aliens that are both believable and suitably alien. I'll give you that. But then again, it would require biologists to really understand what would go into making an alien believable and yet also suitably alien. Anyway, that was Q&A 64. Make sure you keep asking questions and I will catch you guys in later videos.